Since assuming office in 2015, the coalition government has been creating and rolling out many transformational projects in the hinterland communities that are seeing improvement in the living standards of the indigenous peoples through job creation and strengthened entrepreneurial and institutional capacities of the local village economies. In this edition of InfoHub Extended, we look at two of the projects being executed in the Maruka Subdistrict Region 1, Burima Waini. The future of Guyana has never looked better. Our nation is on the cusp of a development program like never seen before. While Guyana is now emerging as an energy giant through the discovery of massive reserves of oil and natural gas, it is your government's intention that the huge benefits emerging from this will go where it matters most, to you, the people of this beloved country. There is a surge of confidence in the way Guyana is governed once again, and the level of investor interest is unprecedented. Guyana is poised to become the breadbasket of the region, and the pace at which this nation will grow through prudent fiscal management will be nothing short of impressive. But more than anything else will be the way every Guyanese, regardless of color, class, or creed, becomes a part of this historic period of national transformation, sharing in the wealth and well-being of it all as one Guyana. A lot can happen over a cup of coffee, and very soon the distinctive fragrance of Santa Rosa's beans will be filling homes in Guyana. This community in the Maruka sub-district was once known for its coffee production, with its factory producing coffee to market in Charity, Region 2. However, over time, this industry dwindled. Santa Rosa is known, or Maruca, is known for growing coffee since I was a little girl. I used to help to climb the trees and pick coffee too. So it's something, you know, I remember from years ago. But when you look, walk around Santa Rosa, Kamaka, Horadaya, and so on now, you see coffee trees here and there. So the industry has died a long time ago. And, but because coffee is a plant that can, you know, last for 90 years and so on, you would still see a few trees. There used to be a factory here that used to um, pulp the coffee and then dry, the, they, they were dryers to dry the coffee and they used to sell it, ship it out to charity and sell it. So this project here really is just resuscitating that industry. Santa Rosa is made up of a collection of 11 settlements spread out across the Savannah wetlands. And given that the areas still have the soil suitable for growing coffee, when given the opportunity to venture into an economic project to stimulate their local economy, the residents quickly organized and decided to revive the coffee industry. This led to the government investing $25 million into the project. In 2018, $10 million was made available for the construction of a shade house nursery and clearing of 15 acres of land. The constructed shade house nursery will accommodate over 13,000 in vitro, disease-free, sterile stage 1, robusta coffee plantlets that arrived from the Nature Source Improved Plants Laboratory in Tapachula, Mexico. The plants were delivered on February 24 by Leroy Santiago of Mexico, a coffee specialist who is assisting the farmers in this venture. The start of the project includes building this nursery here. Building this nursery, it's 100 by, I think, 30, 30 feet, and um, acquiring the, the um, seedlings and all these fertilizers, and not fertilizers then, but mixtures, and they're organic mixtures, paddy from... Um, from the paddy um, uh, what is it? Paddy shells from the paddy mills in um, Region Two there, and you have the um, chicken manure and pro mix. So they're mixing that up there in, in preparation for the arrival of the coffee um, plantlets. One of the Santa Rosa farmers, Viber Torres, told InfoHub that Santiago provided them with the know-how to prepare the soil for the coffee. We're mixing the creek sand from the creek, a topsoil that is around here, just the topsoil, the black sand, and then we have um, the burnt paddy with, with the chicken mole that he brings from the coast, that he brought from the coast, and dry paddy shells. 
we mixed it together, and that's what you see in Longley, what we are putting in this in these plastic bags. You know what they brought in this morning, those white boxes. Yeah, that's a pro mixture. Uh -huh. it's, a, it's a special um, humus, uh, a, prep, a special prepared soil. The next step now is to lay them out there, as you've seen, in, in a uniform way. So um, when the coffee do comes, which, which will come anytime, we will just in, in put the coffee plant in this. Make a hole in this, and you put the coffee inside. And you leave it in the north. Yeah, in the north, and then you, we have the, the the shades, the, um, the special irrigation here, water cans where we're going to water them. Yeah. Night and day we have to be carrying these things. The coffee plantlets are watered frequently and shielded from bright sunlight for just over two months before they are ready to be transplanted into the farms. Planting will take place during the wet season so that the soil remains moist while the roots become firmly established. Minister Garrido Lowe explained that 15 farmers from the 11 satellite communities will receive 800 plantlets per acre. This is a family, family oriented kind of farming where you will have mommy and daddy and children all involved in caring for the acre of plants. So um, it, they will be transported 800 plants plantlets per acre to the different um, to the different satellite communities. Santa Rosa has 11 satellite communities. So what we tried to do was to have one acre of coffee farm, one acre of coffee, which consists of 800 plants in each satellite. That's to begin with. So you see the farmers are very industrious here. They are very excited that their plantlets are arriving. Minister Garida Lowe described the initiative as the beginning of something great. She noted that the facility will serve as a research center and can also be a spin-off for many more coffee projects in the future. That is um, how the APN UFC government is um, moving forward to empower the indigenous people economically in a, a green, uh, environmentally friendly and sustainable way. I think it's the best thing that could have happened ever since. I mean, the best thing could have happened for the people. This is a start of an industry that would last for years to come. And not only that, you know, I had approached Nari to um, let us get, get on, let us do this project. Nari, of course, is very willing. They're always there to help. But they couldn't give me much advice because they don't know about coffee. So I think they will come on board. They, well, they already visited with me, the different farms, a representative from Nari, and we tested soil and so on. But they will come on board now to learn about growing the coffee. And because right around here, we have some extra plants, 12,000 plants, Let's plus more will be coming. So what we plan to do is plant them around so that it will be like an experiment different types of robusta coffee including the coffee that is from um, that we found here will be grow, planted there to experiment and see how it grows and how how, uh, how it will turn out how much coffee it will bear how many times it will bear things like that so this lit, this little establishment here that you see now the beginnings of it's only the beginning of something wonderful because it will be a research center not only for the Maruca Santa Rosa farmers, the 15 farmers, but also for Nari. With the assistance of the Ministry of Social Protection's Cooperative Society Department, the Santa Rosa Coffee Co-op was formed. Another farmer, Janet Fredericks, explained how she got involved in the project. I get involved through the two show and the counselors them. Mm -hmm. and I wasn't really interested, but after we started to work and clear the land and do a lot of stuff, I just like it. We have to keep it up. We just don't have to just collect the plants, carry it in the farm and leave it there. We have to take care of it just like we take care of our kids, you know, or other plants at the farm, you know. And eventually 
time to come that I will invest for me and my family. Very good. I look, look at it very good. It's nice. This year, an additional $15 million was allocated to the construction and furnishing of the processing facility. This is where we'll start building the facility and uh, um, start to furnish it and so on, but mostly to build the facility, the processing, the processing facility. It's a three-year project and the coffee would be uh, at least within two and a half years it would bear. So we want to be ready when it, uh, when it bears to process it. So what we want to market is Santa Rosa indigenous ground coffee. Everything coming from the hinterland would be at least produced by the indigenous people. So it has an indigenous brand like the tomato ketchup in Parmakatoy that has the indigenous brand. Once the facility is completed and harvesting starts, the cherries are processed as soon as possible to avoid spoilage. Depending on available location, the dry of wet method can be used to process the coffee. These involves drying, milling and exporting the beans, tasting and roasting the coffee. In the meantime, while the coffee is growing in the farms, the shade house will be used to cultivate other crops. Over at Quebana, also in the Maruca sub-district, the residents are adding value to their cassava production following the investment of $26 million by the government into the project. Work on the construction of the facility began in December 2018 at a cost of $10 million. The funds also catered for the clearing and preparation of 30 acres of land and the purchasing of cassava sticks for planting. An additional $16 million was allocated this year for equipping the facility. The project has already created employment for several villagers who supplied most of the material being used with jobs created for the actual construction. Tushau of Quebana and Vice Chairman of the National Tushau's Council, Paul Pierre, said the project was initiated by the Ministry of Indigenous Peoples Affairs after consultations with the residents. We said that cassava production, the flower production could be a good thing for us, um, boost agriculture and um, value added, you know, add value to the product. So that's currently why we suggested this program. We are now almost you know, on a point of completion. Um, as I said, this would not be a benefit only to this community, but actually the entire Maruka sub-region, Maburuma, and as far as Port Kaituma, Machu and the other areas. The Kubana Farmers Cooperative was established with guidance from the Ministry of Social Protection's Cooperative Society Department. Chairman of the Co-op, Fabian France, explained that a number of studies were carried out on the sweet cassava before deciding on the project. We never had this kind of opportunity from before, for the very first time. God. Um, from the beginning, I, I really started when the minister come in, she keep a meeting with me a couple, that was two years ago, and uh, she mentioned about uh, tomato things at um, uh, region eight or nine. God. Um, now, when she come up with this cassava, it's just what they want, that they waiting for this. God. Because I carry out a study, that's why they vote me as this, the, the chairman for this, for this project. Because um, one thing that um, we, we, I try, I invent on the sweet cassava. I carry out a study on it, right? And it, it, it works good. It comes to good flower and it stays some months, right? Even without sealing. In addition to the over 30 farmers that will directly benefit from the project, residents from surrounding areas, including Santa Cruz and Barama, will also cash in. Training in the processing of the cassava flour will be conducted by the Ministry of Social Protection's Board of Industrial Training Department. The Ministry of Business will be assisting in training for the packaging. Not only will the factory produce cassava flour for use in the region and further afield, but it will be producing casrup, starch and other cassava byproducts. Once completed, the community will be seeking markets through the school's hot meal programs and supply the three dormitories in the sub-districts, Mabaruma, Maruka and Martakai. This transformative project will benefit the 900 residents residing in Quabano. These initiatives have been tailored to improve the socio-economic status of the people living in the hinterland and ultimately eliminate the culture dependency on government support within indigenous communities. Thank you for watching another edition of Intohub Extended.